Hello guys welcome to my humble YouTube channel where I bring you fanfiction that will brighten your days. Before we start a subscribe is greatly appreciated and don't forget to leave a like and ring the bell icon so you won't miss exciting new fanfiction stories. True God in Another World, Tensura X Tibate, by Tempest underscore King underscore 20. Chapter 10 Contact with the Parents Rimuru Pav After a night filled with embarrassment, I awoke from my slumber, feeling a slight heaviness on my chest. Slowly, I opened my eyes, only to be greeted by the calm expression of Seal, the girl who had become not only my partner, but also my other half. It was the first time I had slept beside a girl, and the realization hit me like a wave of emotions. Seal had been there for me when I was in the depths of darkness, right after my reincarnation. When I couldn't hear, see, or speak, she was the one who broke through that void and gave me comfort, extinguishing the loneliness that threatened to consume me. Without her or the guidance of the wise sage of that time, I most likely wouldn't have survived for long. My naivety had led me to make countless mistakes, but Seal had always been there to save me from myself. Her presence and unwavering support had been my lifeline, allowing me to achieve what I had achieved thus far. Unable to contain the overwhelming gratitude I felt towards her, I lightly touched Ciel's cheek, my fingertips caressing her soft skin. Just as I started to stroke her face, Seal stirred awake, her eyes met mine for a fleeting moment, causing both of us to blush. Gee good morning, master, she stuttered, her voice laced with shyness. I mustered a small smile, my fingers still lingering on her cheek. Good morning, Seal, I replied, my voice filled with affection. The momentary embarrassment began to fade, and I suggested, I guess we should get up now. However, CL's expression turned slightly downcast at my words. Hi, master, she said, her tone indicating a hint of sadness. Realizing the unintentional implicate behind my statement, I hastily corrected myself. I mean, we can sleep together tonight too, if you want, I offered, feeling my face flush with embarrassment once again. At the sudden prospect of spending more nights together, CL's eyes broadened in excitement, a radiant smile spreading across her face. Really? She shouted with an excited tone, her happiness palpable. I couldn't help but pat her head gently, causing her cheeks to turn the color of a ripe tomato. Yeah, you can do that anytime you want, I reassured her, a tender warmth filled my heart. But we should be cautious not to be seen. For now, though, you need to return to my soul. With a nod of understanding, Seal responded eagerly, Hi, and just like that, she disappeared. I groggily climbed out of my warm, cozy bed, feeling the cool air hit my skin as I stood up. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I shuffled my way to the bathroom, eager to start my day with a refreshing shower. After cleansing myself, I reached for the clothes that the elves had bestowed upon us. They were exquisite, made with delicate fabrics and intricate designs. Once dressed, I decided to practice a little meditation, hoping to center myself before the day ahead. Closing my eyes, I focused on my breathing, allowing my thoughts to settle. But as I delved deeper into my meditation, a sense of surprise washed over me. Somehow, I had already reached the light orange stage, surpassing my expectations. Curiosity peaked, I turned to Seal, seeking answers. Do you know what happened, Seal? I thought I'd be in the solid orange stage by now. CL's ethereal voice resonated in my mind, providing the knowledge I sought. Less than less than indeed, master. As you anticipated, your meditation technique was meant to elevate you to the solid orange stage. However, the merging of ether with your physical form has hastened the purification process of your core, albeit in a gradual manner. Greater than greater than. A thought sparked within me, an idea that seemed almost too good to be true. So if I were to absorb more ether into my body, would that further purify my core? And what if I were to create an ether nucleus? Could it accelerate my progress towards the white core, or perhaps even aid me in reaching the integration stage? Sylvia interjected with a sense of urgency. Less than wait. I strongly advise against attempting such a feat, greater than. Perplexed by her warning, I probed further. Why shouldn't I pursue this avenue? If creating an ether nucleus can help me progress swiftly, why should I not do it? Sylvia's response carried a weight of past tragedy, a haunting memory that had scarred her family. Less than believe me, it is not a matter of underestimating your abilities, but rather acknowledging the danger involved. My father, too, had contemplated creating an ether nucleus. However, when he conducted the experiment on a newborn, it ended in tragedy. 
The infant's fragile body could not withstand the immense power, resulting in a disastrous explosion. Greater than. Greater than greater than ha. Why do you even think that I will fail? Don't make assumptions based on your father's failure. Less than less than. Less than less than master. The construction of an ether core is indeed difficult, especially as there is currently not enough ether available to create one. However, even if the adequate amount were to miraculously present itself, I do not recommend its construction at this point. Your physical form, as evolved as it may be, would still struggle to bear the overwhelming power it entails. Greater than greater than. Greater than greater than you see, even Seal said it's not impossible. Less than less than less than but still, greater than. Greater than greater than don't worry. I understand the risks involved, and I will ensure that my body is adequately prepared for such a transformation. If, for any reason, I cannot handle it, I have complete faith in Seal to guide me and help me. Less than less than. A sigh escaped Sylvia's ethereal form. Less than fine. I will trust in your judgment greater than. Greater than greater than then I think I will find a place where there is a lot of ether to do so, but for now I have to go and meet Elder Virian. Less than less than. As I left my room and made my way towards the entrance of the Grand Palace, the butler opened the front door for me, his polite smile greeting me. The morning light streamed through the entrance, casting a warm glow on the surroundings. I spotted a little carriage parked just outside the entrance, its elegant design catching my eye. Inside sat Elder Virian, I approached the carriage and made myself comfortable beside him. Good morning, Elder Virian, I greeted with a respectful nod, acknowledging his wisdom and experience. Good morning, Rimuru. I hope you had a restful sleep, Elder Virian replied warmly. His eyes twinkled with a mixture of kindness and wisdom. Also, there's no need to call me Elder. You can call me grandfather. Okay, then I'll call you grandpa, but will it be okay? I said. At first, he raised an eyebrow confused, but after a moment he understood what I meant. Elder Virian nodded, a gentle smile tugging at his lips. Yes, my son has agreed to it, and an official announcement has already been made regarding your stay in our kingdom. A wave of relief washed over me, knowing that our presence was not seen as a threat but rather as a bridge between races. As we continued our conversation, a nagging question that had been on my mind for quite some time finally surfaced. I chose my words carefully, wanting to understand Elder Virian's perspective on the ongoing issues of racism and animosity between different races. Grandpa, I've noticed that while you have taken us, human children, as your disciples, there still seems to be disapproval towards the human. How do you reconcile this difference? I asked. He was the previous king of the elves who had to lead the elves to fight against the humans so it is expected that he would have a lot of hatred for the humans even if the war ended, but now he accepts two humans as his disciples not only that but he gave them the right to speak informally with him and even let them calling him grandfather. Elder Virian's expression became contemplative, his eyes focused inwards as he gathered his thoughts. Well, my dear Rimuru, I don't pay much heed to such things. I have come to realize that while there may be some bad humans, there are also good ones. You and your brother are a shining example of the latter, he explained, his voice filled with gentle conviction. I only wish that my people could see this and let go of their ingrained hatred. His words resonated deep within me, as I understood the weight of his desire to mend the broken bonds between races. Wanting to offer a glimmer of hope amidst the darkness, I quoted a phrase I had heard long ago, spoken by a wise and influential figure. People learn to hate, and if they are able to learn to hate, they should strive to teach them love, because love is closer to the human heart than hatred, I shared, a soft smile forming on my face as I recalled the timeless wisdom behind those words. Elder Virian raised an eyebrow, intrigued by my choice of quote. His curiosity sparked, he inquired, what do you mean by that? Taking a deep breath, I felt a surge of determination course through me. This was my chance to convey the urgency of our mission. Just as the elves have learned about the flaws and vices of humans, they can also learn about their virtues and kindness, I explained earnestly. It may not be easy, as their hatred has been passed down through generations, but with a concerted effort, we can work towards erasing the prejudice that the elves hold. Silence hung in the air as the elder absorbed my words, contemplating the potential for change. I could sense the weight of responsibility on his shoulders, a burden shared by all who sought harmony among the races. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, he nodded slowly, his eyes filled with a newfound determination. You speak true, he said, 
his voice filled with conviction. We have allowed ourselves to be blinded by resentment for far too long. It is time we open our hearts and minds, to truly see the beauty in each race. Relief flooded over me as I realized the seeds of understanding were beginning to take root. We had a long journey ahead, but this conversation marked a crucial step towards bridging the gap of hatred that separated our races. As a king who ruled over many races equally, it was agonizing to witness the conflicts and animosity between them. I yearned for a world where cooperation and unity prevailed. Humans, in all the worlds I had encountered, possessed a greed that led them to belittle and oppress other races. They arrogantly deemed themselves superior, despite lacking the power and wisdom of dragons, the connection to nature that the elves enjoyed, or the craftsmanship of the dwarves. This poisonous belief was the root cause of the struggle we now faced which I have to fix, if I want to prepare and win the next war, I need the three races to cooperate with each other or we will surely lose. Yet, amidst the darkness, a beacon of hope emerged when we found Tess, on the brink of falling into the clutches of slave traders from the Elshire forest. By saving her, we not only prevented another war with the humans but also discovered an opportunity to transform the deep-seated prejudice that existed within our own royal family. With great care, I had handed them notes, meticulously detailing our plan to save as many imprisoned elves as possible. By revealing that these efforts were spearheaded by humans, I hoped to challenge their perception of our race. If the elves could witness firsthand the compassion and empathy present within our ranks, perhaps their animosity would gradually diminish. As I reflected upon the twists of fate that led me to this point, I couldn't help but marvel at the interconnectedness of our world. It was as if some unseen force had guided me toward this pivotal moment, a chance for redemption and transformation. I held onto that hope tightly and prayed that our efforts would bear fruit, bringing the three races closer together and forging a future built on unity rather than discord. You're absolutely right, Gramps agreed, a twinkle of excitement in his eyes. We should definitely continue discussing this with my son later. And of course, if you're willing to help us, we would greatly appreciate it. I nodded eagerly. With a determined gaze, Gramps glanced out the window his eyes scanning the horizon. A small smile tugged at the corners of his lips. Well then, it's time to go see my friend. Your brother and Tess have already arrived. His eyes focused on figures approaching the chariot, their forms becoming clearer as they neared. Tess took the first seat, settling herself gracefully across from us. Art soon followed, his figure sliding into the seat beside Tess. As they greeted us in unison with a cheerful, good morning. We engaged in light conversation, our voices intermingling with the gentle breeze, preparing ourselves for the journey ahead. The atmosphere remained calm yet filled with an undercurrent of excitement as we admired the picturesque scenery passing by, the vibrant hues of the wildflowers serving as a backdrop to our conversation. As the journey continued, Tessia, her eyes heavy with exhaustion, succumbed to sleep, her head gently leaned against Art's shoulder. It was then that Gramps softened his voice a mixture of concern and tenderness seeping through his words. Take good care of her, guys, she has grown up in a terribly lonely environment, he uttered, his words barely above a whisper, as if sharing a well-kept secret. A profound empathy gleamed in his wise eyes as he glanced at his slumbering granddaughter, his love for her evident in every line on his aging face. Perplexed, Art inquired, what do you mean, Gramps, leaning in as well, his voice laden with understanding began to unravel a deeply buried truth. Growing up as the only princess in the entire kingdom, Tessia bore the weight of immense stress, he admitted, his voice heavy with the weight of her past. It was far too much for a child to bear. She lacked any close friends, which only compounded her hardship. Every person who approached her did so with ulterior motives, seeking to exploit her for personal gain. It's no wonder she became cold and distant towards those around her. Imagine how surprised we all were when we saw you three holding hands. I couldn't help but connect the dots, the puzzle pieces falling into place as I realized the magnitude of Tessia's guardedness and apprehension. These newfound friendships we had formed meant the world to her, and the thought of losing us brought her immense sadness and fear. Art, his eyes widening with understanding, nodded silently, his heart heavy with the weight of Tessia's difficult upbringing. Yes, we could sense her guarded nature when she spoke to the guards. A sense of gratitude filled Gramps' voice as he spoke, his words accompanied by gentle pats on our arms, as if expressing his thanks through touch. You have no idea how much Tessia has blossomed around you. 
she has shown more expressions, smiles, and laughter than she ever did in her lonely upbringing. Finally, she is able to truly embrace her childhood. For that, I am eternally grateful to both of you. With his words lingering in the air, the carriage came to a graceful stop. The driver opened our carriage door, informing us that we had arrived at our destination. Hey Tess, wake up, Arthur whispered softly, his fingers gently patting the young girl's sleepy head. Tess stirred from her slumber, her eyes fluttering open, and together we stepped out of the carriage, finding ourselves standing before a quaint and rustic hut. Impatience radiated from Grandpa Virian as he wasted no time in revealing his true character. His fist pounded against the worn wooden door with a fervor that echoed through the silence, his booming voice demanding to be heard. Hey, you old witch, come out, he bellowed, his impatience hanging heavily in the air. As if anticipating his arrival, the door swung open swiftly, revealing an elder woman with a bent and weathered frame. Her gray hair bore the marks of time's touch, each strand seemingly touched by the electric spark of lightning. Her eyes, wrinkled and eerily captivating, held a mesmerizing blend of colors that seemed to dance and merge together. She was dressed in a simple brown robe that hung loosely around her frail figure, showcasing her enigmatic presence. Took you long enough to get here, she scowled, a mixture of amusement and frustration lacing her voice. Grandpa Virian introduced us with gusto. Ha ha ha, Arthur, Rimuru, he exclaimed. Let me introduce you to Rinia Darkasan. She's a very special deviant amongst us elves. A genuine smile tugged at the corners of Rinya's lips as her gaze shifted towards Tess. Her smile widened with affection as she reached out to gently pat Tess's head, her touch carrying a reassurance that put Tess at ease. It's good seeing you again, Virian. Charming as always, little Tessia, she greeted, her voice carrying a softness that juxtaposed her worn appearance. Finally, her attention turned to me, her wrinkled hand extending in a gesture of respect and acknowledgement. Her voice carried a hint of anticipation as she introduced herself. We finally meet, young Lewins. I am Rinia, a diviner, she declared, her words holding a weight that hinted at the power and knowledge she possessed. Hum, a diviner, huh? I can certainly make use of that, I whispered softly to myself, the possibilities swirling within my mind. Did you say something, Re? Arthur asked curiously, having caught wind of my murmured words due to our close proximity. No, it's just your imagination, I smiled at him, purposefully using the teasing phrase that Seal often employed. Less than less than hey master, you can't steal my line, greater than greater than ignoring Ciel's protests, we followed Rinia into her humble abode, settling ourselves around a sturdy circular table with a jug of water placed enticingly in the center. Um, Elder Rinia, Arthur's voice quivered with anticipation as he addressed the elderly diviner. His wide eyes were fixed on the mysterious jug of water, curiosity oozing from every pore. You mentioned being a diviner, right? I'm a little lost as to what it is you can do. Gramps said that I'd be able to find out if my parents are okay by seeing you. Rinya's wrinkled face creased into a mischievous grin as she chuckled in response. Kakeke, Grandpa, huh? Virian, you really have let yourself go if you're allowing youngsters like them to call you that. Bah. There are always exceptions, if any other brat dares to call me something like, Grandpa, I'll have them hung upside down and beaten with a cactus. Grandpa Virian declared, a mischievous glint in his eyes as he looked at us, his deep laughter filled the room. However, Rinya's amusement quickly faded as her gaze hardened into a stern glare aimed at Arthur and me. Her voice rang out suddenly, Brats, you don't even know where your parents are, but you want to travel all over Sapin to find them and then come back here to train? you'd be already dead by the time you make yourself back here. Confusion swirled within us as we exchanged glances, silently questioning whether Grandpa Virian had confided in Rinia about our intentions. Sensing our unspoken thoughts, Grandpa shook, his eyes betrayed a hint of worry. I didn't tell Rinia any of this. There isn't much you can hide from her, but usually she doesn't bother looking into a person. What makes you so nosy, Rinia? Rinya's gaze softened slightly as she locked eyes with the elderly man. You and I both know they're special. So special, in fact, that there are parts of their lives that even I can't see. Arthur, whatever the beast that passed it will onto you is, it's not an ordinary beast. Limiting it to an SS class wouldn't give it justice. She then turned to me, her gaze filled with intrigue. 
But the strangest thing is you, Rimuru. I can only see that you exist in this world, but I cannot know anything else, as if there was something preventing me from seeing your future or your past. Greater than greater than seal. Less than less than my thoughts turned to seal. Less than less than she couldn't see anything because you were an entity that transcends time and space, but I showed her about your existence so that she would not be confused by your presence and her inability to see you. Greater than greater than. Enough about that, though, Rinia interjected, redirecting our attention to the matter at hand. Arthur Rimuru, you're here to see your parents, so that's what I'll help you do. Close your eyes for a moment and picture your parents. Focus on their appearance and their mana signature. I'll take care of the rest. Obeying Rinya's instructions, we closed our eyes, summoning the last vivid memory we had of our parents. The image of my father, badly wounded, and my mother, desperately healing him, played like a heartfelt movie in the theater of our minds. Well, you can open your eyes now, Rinya announced, her eyes swirling with mesmerizing colors of sapphire blue and amethyst purple. The water within the ornate glass jug began to defy gravity, floating out of the container in gentle, graceful streams. The droplets converged and formed a spiraling disc in midair, shimmering with a soft, ethereal glow. With bated breath, Arthur and I looked expectantly at Rinia, eagerly awaiting the miracle we had come to witness. I glanced at Rinia, mesmerized by the swirling colors in her eyes, as the water continued to levitate and swirl around her. The spiraling disc grew larger, taking on a form that resembled a watery portal. And then, just as suddenly as the water had defied gravity, an image began to emerge within the watery vortex. Clear as day, our parents materialized within the spiraling disc, sitting together around a beautifully set dining table. It was a different location, not our familiar home in Ashbur. My mother appeared slightly paler, but her smile still radiant as ever. I could see that she had lost weight, her slender figure accentuated by the way her clothes now hung loosely. My father looked the same, his rugged features etched with a combination of weariness and pride. He now wore a finely tailored uniform, the insignia adorning his chest indicating a position of importance. His neatly trimmed beard added a touch of maturity to his appearance. Overwhelmed with emotion, Arthur began to cry tears of joy. I reached out and patted him on the back, feeling his trembling hands. Taking his hand in mine, Art managed to say, T thank you, Elder Rinia. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for showing us this. Arthur was trying his best not to cry uncontrollably and I could sense Rinya's discomfort with such genuine displays of gratitude. Ahem. Let me show you where they are now, Rinya zoomed out the image within the water, revealing that our parents were currently residing in the kingdom of Zyrus. This information served as a glimmer of hope, as we knew that the portal connecting the kingdom of Eleanor to the kingdom of Sapin existed in Zyrus. All right, Arthur, Rimuru, it's time to let them know that you're alive, Grandpa Virian said, clapping his hands. Grandpa Virian had informed us earlier of the strict regulations controlling communications between the kingdom of Eleanor and Sapin. However, Rinia, being a diviner hidden from the kingdom of Sapin's detection, provided us with a certain degree of unregulated freedom. To establish a temporary link, I will infuse some of my innate mana into both of you, Rinia explained. Once I give you the signal, start speaking as if you're directly communicating with your parents. Bear in mind that they will hear your voices inside their heads so they may not immediately believe what is happening. It is crucial to convince them that it is truly you speaking and that they are not going insane. Remember, this connection will be brief, so say what you need to within two minutes, she asserted, her eyes filled with a sense of urgency. We nodded in understanding, our hearts pounding with a mix of excitement and anxiety. Rinia gazed intently at us, her swirling eyes filled with determination, before finally declaring, dot and go. Hi mom, hello dad. It's your son, Rimuru. We know this may come as a shock to hear our voices inside your heads. But, first and foremost, we want you to know that Arthur and I are alive. We survived the fall from the cliff and, through a series of unexpected events, we ended up in the kingdom of Eleanor with the elves. Please, keep this information to yourselves. We don't have much time, so we'll focus on the most crucial details. A friend of ours, Rinia, a diviner like you, Mom, has granted us the ability to communicate with you like this. We desperately want to return to you both as soon as possible, but circumstances prevent us from doing so at this time. I assure you, I am safe and alive, although I am struggling with an illness within my body that requires treatment before I can come back. 
Please, do not worry. As long as I stay here with the elves and receive their care, I am hopeful for a full recovery. We cannot predict how long it will take for us to reunite physically, but know that we hold on to hope and the certainty that we will be back home together. We love you both so deeply, and we miss you every single day. Stay safe, Dad, and please keep Mom and our unborn siblings safe as well. Mom, please ensure that Dad does not take unnecessary risks. Your sons, Arthur and Rimuru. As Art finished speaking, Arthur's tears flowed even more freely. I wrapped my arm around him, pulling him into a comforting embrace and gently patting his back. While I managed to maintain composure, because I knew that they were fine because I was asking Seal to check on them. However, a single tear escaped my eye, and I quickly wiped it away, not wanting to burden Arthur further. Elder Rinia, words cannot express how grateful we are for your assistance, Arthur managed to say between sobs. Train well and continue to cherish those close to you, children. That is how you can truly thank me, Rinia responded with a warm smile. And don't forget to visit this old grandma once in a while. I can get quite lonely, you know, Kakeke. With a sense of finality, Grandpa Virian took a step forward. It is time for us to head back to the castle, he announced. Turning to Rinia, he added, once again, we are deeply grateful for your assistance today. We made sure to express our thanks to Rinia one more time before embarking on our journey back to the castle. 